All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today as we uh, continue our discussion about uh, the impact of hybrid cloud on things like DNS and, and IP address management. Uh, I'm uh, Scott Penny. I'm uh, with the strategy office at Blue Cat. I am joined today by Andrew Wortkin, who is our chief strategy officer. And what Andrew and I are going to be uh, showing you today in our demonstration is how to take control over what's happening from a DNS standpoint in the cloud. So I'm going to spend about 20, 25 minutes going through what we call our cloud discovery and visibility solution. And then Andrew is actually going to pivot and talk about sort of how real world applications work in a multi-cloud world. Just to re-level set, you know, when, when we at BlueCAD go out and we talk to customers about, you know, cloud and, and the challenges that that brings, it, it's actually shockingly consistent, you know, what, what struggles they're having. And it, it really boils down into these four sort of key things. The first one is, you know, cloud changes rapidly and, you know, traditional network operations teams that, that generally manage these DNS, DHCP, IP address management solutions, they don't necessarily get involved in what's happening there, right? It's, it's sort of a new frontier and, and the cloud teams will go out and they'll make, you know, a hundred changes a day. Uh, and, and so the, the teams who are responsible for sort of, you know, bringing order to this chaos, they, they don't, really have visibility. So they can't really keep up with what's going on. And because of that, they see sort of the landscape of DNS getting fractured, right? So, so every time somebody deploys an authoritative DNS server out in Amazon or Azure, they're basically creating a, a silo of DNS. And when you have all these silos, you start to introduce the, the potential for conflicts, right? If I deploy IP space in Azure that conflicts with IP space that I have in my data center. What happens when those two things then connect up? Same thing happens for DNS. If I deploy a, a zone that I use internally for an external facing application, suddenly I'm going to run into resolution problems. So, so every time I have these islands or silos of DNS, I, I start to increase the likelihood that something bad is going to happen. The third thing really is uh, the, the concept of cloud is all about going fast and, and and making changes rapidly and deploying services and scaling them and shrinking them. Uh, and if, if you have a dependency on, on a traditional DDI solution, um, that might slow things down. And, and I think we all know that when you slow down cloud operations or any operations team, people are going to start to look for ways to go around that, that bottleneck, right? So, so the DNS teams, they need to have ways to deal with the automation that's happening in their environment but also participate in it, right? They need to be able to deploy their services and scale them and, and change them, you know, based on code rather than based on logging into a dashboard and, and clicking through an interface. And the final challenge here is that once you start instantiating all of these islands of, of, of compute and DNS and networks, it's hard to route between them, right? So, so the way that you do it in the world of DNS is, you know, you create all kinds of, you know, custom forwarding rules and, and you know, try to manage that. But if you're managing that at scale across you know, 50 Azure subscriptions and 100 AWS accounts, uh, that's kind of a recipe for disaster. So, um, so these, are, these are kind of the basic things that, that people are running into uh, in this world of DNS and cloud. So what are we gonna show you today? Uh, so we're gonna show you real-time sort of visibility and, and discovery of what's in these cloud networks. Uh, so we're gonna show how that gets discovered and, and sort of real-time monitored for changes. We're then going to show you how you can take what information is discovered and, and being updated and, and sort of push that out back into DNS appliances and cloud so that you can take control over resolution uh, in those environments. I'm also going to touch pretty quickly on you know, some of the ways that we can you know, speed up how teams interface with a DNS solution um, using Terraform providers and, and Terraform scripts and things like that to deploy infrastructure and update host records. And then finally, Andrew is going to uh, show you how we can sort of bring all of this stuff together. And, and he's going to do that by sort of going through a, a simulated uh, cloud-based application that has a bunch of dependencies that happen to be in different locations and how you can simplify sort of the management of resolution paths across all of those things. So that's what we're going to get into. Uh, and so now it is time to demo. All right, so the first thing that we're going to look at here uh, is, is uh, data in our Blue Cat Address Manager. So uh, our DDI solution, our DNS, DHCP IP Address Management solution has a control plane. 
And by and large, the Blue Cat Address Manager is kind of the brains of the operation. So this is the solution where an administrator is going to manage their IP space. They're going to set up DHCP configurations and deploy those options to various servers. This is where they're going to define all their DNS zones, whether that's internal, external. Uh, this is this is basically where everything is configured so that um, so that it can be deployed globally. So I'm going to go ahead and log in. All right. So this is a this is an empty Blue Cat Address Manager. So you can even see from this screen that I have no configuration. Uh, so in Blue Cat terms, a configuration is is a data set, right? So so generally speaking, I'm I've got one or maybe multiple configurations where I'm storing all of this data and I can use those in, in kind of different ways. But I just deployed this one uh, a couple hours ago via Terraform script. And so it is, it is simply empty, uh, but we're gonna be doing a lot of work in here. So I just wanted to sort of set the stage that, that this is kind of the control plane for everything that we're doing. Now let's, uh, let's put Excuse some me. data um, yes. Sorry, I hope the default admin name is not admin. For everything, uh, so the the default name uh, login name is admin. The uh, the password is actually randomly generated, uh, so it's not as bad as you probably are thinking. And and of course, you can disable that and uh, and put in your own users as well. Right, customers would always put this behind uh, usually some sort of SSO or anything else. So it's uh, it's you know um, rarely would get used in in the wild. Right. Yep, good question though. Uh, and yes, all of this stuff is gonna get torn down right after the uh, Tech Field Day presentation. So you won't be poking at these IP addresses. Uh, all right, so, uh, so I'm, I'm switching over to another tab here. So this is Blue Cat Gateway. And here I'm gonna log in with, you'll be happy to see a, a different username. And Blue Cat Gateway is really our automation and integration platform. So if you want to do an integration with ServiceNow, uh, you can go to our GitHub page, you'll find a module for ServiceNow that allows you to, you know, do provisioning of Blue Cat data essentially from ServiceNow. If you want to integrate with Cisco ACI, uh, you can go to our GitLab page and you can find a plugin for Gateway that allows you to go and extract information from Cisco ACI. Uh, so this is, this is really where we do the integrations, but also the automation. So a lot of times, you know, to keep up with user requests, we'll build um, and again, these are these are available on GitHub. Uh, simplified administration GUIs for for mass users. So if somebody wants to, uh, you know, request a new network, a slash twenty six or something like that, um, you may give certain users the permission to do that. They can come in here, um, get a, a logical next network to provision, and go ahead and do that. Uh, so that's what that's what Gateway is all about. We're going to focus today really on a specific workflow that we call cloud discovery and visibility. And this one is specific to AWS. Um, we have versions for Google Cloud Platform. We have uh, versions for Azure. Um, they're all sort of coming together into a common interface very shortly. Um, but what this workflow really does is it allows us to configure a cloud provider as a source of information that we want to shove back into that address manager. Okay, and I'll, I'll just sort of walk through the configuration and, and sort of talk to it as we go. So the first thing you're gonna need, of course, is you're going to need access uh, to those cloud resources. So I've generated a set of keys here that we're gonna use. Um, if your organization, and hopefully they all do, uh, do things like multi-factor authentication or you have to go through AWS role assumption or, or, or things like that, you can, you can do that in my test environment here. I, I didn't necessarily bother with the complexity. So I've uh, put in my credentials. Now I'm going to decide where in this AWS cloud, which region I want to do discovery on. Um, so you can do this multiple times. I'm going to do US East one. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to stick this into a configuration, whoops, called US East one as well. Again, configurations are sort of a data set. So what I'm essentially doing is saying, go out to this region in Amazon, pull all the information, shove it into a blue cat configuration of the same name, just to keep it easy. Uh, I'm gonna check this one for luck, even though I shouldn't have to. Now I get into the point where I can define what I want to discover. So Amazon, as, as most people probably know, has all kinds of information, uh, all kinds of things that you can deploy there. Um, we can discover a, a whole lot of it. Uh, and so for purposes of today, I'm, I'm just gonna go crazy. I'm just gonna click everything. So I'm gonna, find the public IP ranges of we have any load balancers to find their, you know, internal host names, EC2 instance information, I want it all. And I'm going to stick these into these view object types within BAM. 
and views, Andrew kind of touched on it in a previous presentation where, you know, when I'm resolving from an external host, uh, I might get a different answer than I'm getting if I'm resolving from an internal host. And of course, AWS, Azure, Google Cloud Platform, they all have the concept of external DNS and internal DNS. So I want to keep those separate because I don't want those things to sort of overlap on each other. So I'm just going to go ahead and throw those into separate views. Uh, we could do something different if we wanted. Uh, and also, I want to go down here and discover AWS's Route 53 public and private zone and IP information. And again, we're going to put those in different views just to keep everything nice and organized. Now, here is where we can start to bring some of this stuff together. So here we can define a zone that we're managing internally in BlueCat that we want to sort of push all of this information to. And here I'm just going to create a, a zone for tech field day. So tfd.com, I'm going to create that one. I'm going to check that one for luck as well. And that's really the configuration for discovery. Okay, so this part of the workflow is going to go out, grab all the information and put it in. But I said earlier, and I meant it, that this stuff changes all the time. So just doing a point in time discovery, even if you do it once a day, is not generally good enough. Okay, so we need to in enable what we call visibility after discovery. Uh, and this is something that's going to monitor specific resources in Amazon to see if things change. So I'm going to go ahead and give the credentials that I'm going to use to do these updates. And I got to grab those service account keys again. And we cross our fingers and we hit start discovery. All right. So here's what's going on. You'll see these little blue pop-ups sliding in over on the side, sort of, sort of telling us what's going on. Uh, and you see this one here, it says creating AWS visibility resources. Now it's discovering VPCs from this Amazon cloud, um, discovering IP information. I, I, I sort of laugh um, sometimes when I watch this process because this process actually takes probably about five seconds uh, because it's a series of simple API calls to Amazon. Um, our application just wants to give you status. So it does the, the cool animation so that uh, everybody can feel good about uh, making progress. So. Here we go, it's, uh, it's kind of figuring everything out, um, completed discovery. Um, and again, I wanna mention that you can have multiple configurations of this going at any given time, right? And we've talked about how you have multiple AWS accounts and you may deploy you know, EC2s and load balancers into all kinds of different regions in there. Uh, so you can actually manage multiples of these um, uh, from a single location. So we're, we're complete here. So let's go and see what actually happened. If we go here to the discovery tab, uh, you'll see that I've got some discoveries. This is the one we just did. So let me click on that one and scroll down. So here's just sort of a summary of what we discovered. So we discovered some public DNS, private DNS, some load balancers, a couple of those, uh, a bunch of public IP ranges, some subnets, you know, you, you can see for yourself. And if we go over here into visibility, you'll see that we started a visibility job. Okay, so this one's running. If I click on it, I won't see anything because nothing has changed at this point, right? This is actually a fairly static environment uh, that Andrew and I use for demos. Uh, but okay, we've got those going. Uh, from in here, I could, I could go in and I could terminate those visibility sessions, all that kind of stuff, but that's okay. We'll just sort of take what we have. All right, so we've completed discovery. So now let's go back over into Address Manager and see what happened. All right, so first thing, let me refresh the page and we'll see a couple of differences. So first off, we've created a, a, a configuration group uh, because we did discovery in Amazon Web Services. So it automatically nicely created one of those and it created a configuration in there called US East One. If I had multiple configurations, they'd all be listed there. Just kind of helps me navigate. The other thing that we did was we have populated a bunch of these tabs that used to be empty. So for example, if I go to my devices tab, now I can see that there is a bunch of stuff in my address manager that is mapped to what was discovered in Amazon. Okay, so for example, we are here on this TFD BAM 52.3.223, whatever, and that is actually the IP address that I'm hitting. Okay, so this is basically everything that, that got pulled in here. Here you can see a load balancer. So here's the load balancer IPs that I believe Andrew is using for, uh, for some of his demonstration. Uh, so, all right, I've got all this stuff, it's great. So I've got all the devices. And more importantly, in some cases, if I go over here to the DNS now, this is where I actually manage my zones and resource records. 
I can verify that I've imported all of that correctly. So I'm just going to use uh, AWS name resolution external. And here, as, uh, as we were talking about earlier, we've got a top level domain.com. Here's tfd.com, which is what I told the discovery engine to dump everything into. And now if I go to subzones, you'll see that I've automatically created subzones for each of these AWS regions. And I want to make sure that I show you a couple of these things. So if I go into A, here's all the stuff in region one, US East 1A, that, uh, that was generated this morning using my Terraform scripts. Okay. And if I go back and we go into 1C, we'll see some of the stuff that Andrew's going to use. So this TF web demo is going to be used when he sort of describes how this, uh, this cloud-based application works. Okay, so I have all of this information now um, in here. Um, I said that I turned on discovery, so let's, let's go take a peek at that. Um, so let's look at one of these records in, in sort of my zone here, or my uh, sub zone. So let's look at this test client. So this is something again that I uh, did via Terraform earlier today. Uh, I'm gonna save that host name just to do some testing later. And so I turned on visibility, which means if I go over here into my EC2 management console in Amazon, and I go to my running instances, and I find that test client, here he is right here. And I stop this guy. Amazon says it was successfully stopped. I should, now if I go back over here, and there it is, get a message on my uh, discovery and visibility platform that says, look, somebody stopped this instance in this region, in this AWS account, and it was S Penny. Okay, well, that's great. I saw it. So what did I do with it? Let's go back here into Address Manager. So here, if I go to my devices and I have this instant state here, let's find this guy. Test client one is right here. Let me refresh. There we go. Instant state, which we get from Amazon, is stopped. And if I go back into my DNS, you see that that record disappeared. Okay. So we now have in sync DNS information between a cloud provider and our own management system. I have a question. Yes, what happens please. if something happens to the access key or something breaks the connection between the two? Yep, you could reestablish it. So if, uh, if for example, yeah, your, your keys expire, roll over, um, you, would, you could go back in, you could terminate that discovery session, you could uh, just put in the new keys and restart it. So, and it'll, and it'll synchronize the changes. So, it, it, you know, if it finds things that have been deleted, it'll remove those and it'll add new objects and things like that. And if, if, if like connectivity gets disrupted, it's smart enough to, you know, retry in a, on a normal schedule to reestablish connectivity. Good question. All right, so I'm going to start that one back up and we're going to move on to the next thing. So um, there's my, it started up, so it'll uh, show up here in address manager eventually. But what I want to do now is, you know, we've, we've sort of proven this discovery and visibility. Now what I want to do is I want to, I want to talk about extending control of this information into the cloud, into our devices in the cloud. And so the way I'm going to do that is via Terraform script. So uh, this is the output of the Terraform that I ran earlier to deploy everything. Uh, I then actually deleted this object. So this is actually stale. Um, this is the BDDS. It's the Blue Cat DNS DHCP server. So this is the service point that actually, you know, provides name resolution. So I'm going to go ahead and rebuild that BDDS. So I'm just going to hit a Terraform apply and it's going to go out and, you know, figure out what's changed, right? This is a very simple Terraform script that just, you know, goes out and deploys infrastructure. And sure enough, it said, I'm going to add one thing and I'm going to update BDDS IP, public IP address. Uh, I only know that after I apply. So that's fine. So let's go ahead and kick that off. So while this is building, uh, I do want to say sort of a word about this, right? We've talked, um, you know, a bit about, you know, cloud ops teams, DevOps, whatever you want to call them. They, they tend to want to move fast and they tend to want to deploy things not through, um, you know, plugging in console cables or, you know, clicking through web interfaces, they want to deploy this infrastructure as code. They want to just basically write code that defines an application. They want to use something like Terraform to just apply it. 
Um, and that's what I'm doing here. I deployed a, a, a DNS server into the cloud using Terraform. It took, what did it take, 24 seconds, uh, which is pretty cool. The, the other side of this though is when an organization really embraces something like uh, you know, a Terraform or whatever, um, they just want to do basic network operations via Terraform commands. And in this case, maybe I want to provision a resource record in my address manager um, from a Terraform script. So BlueCat, we've, we've provided what's called a Terraform provider uh, for BlueCat. So if you guys are Terraform users, you can go to our GitLab page uh, or GitHub page rather, and you could download that and, and you could create resource records, you could create networks, you can do all that kind of stuff sort of on the fly as part of other code. So let's go ahead and extend control. Before I do that though, I wanna refresh here. So our test client is back because I started it back up in the management console. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna add this new server that I deployed to my configuration. So I'm gonna call it BDDS. Uh, that's the private interface that I just deployed, BDDS. I'm gonna give it the password and I'm gonna cross my fingers and click detect server settings. Uh, all right, so I, I did a detect here and we found the, uh, that new appliance that I deployed and I'm just gonna go ahead and hit add. And this will take a second, but what this is doing, it's establishing secure communication between the address manager and that, that new appliance that I deployed. Uh, and it's uh, figuring out what all that can do for us. And this process here can also be automated. So uh, I did this deployment in sort of the simple way where I just shoved it out and then I went in and manually configured it. I could just make a few API calls to connect this server automatically. But okay, now we have our server out there. Let's do this. Now I'm gonna go back to my DNS. I'm gonna set up what we call a deployment role. Uh, I'm going to deploy this new appliance, just so you can see it, add it. Do that. So now I've associated this zone, this US East 1A.tfd.com with that server. And now I can go out and deploy this data. So this basically takes all of this DNS data and shoves it out to that appliance. Scott, we have a question from uh, Bruno Woolman on Twitter. Yeah. Sure. Uh, he wanted to know what cloud providers the discovery works with. I think you mentioned GCP and Azure is in addition to AWS. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he wanted to know if the functionality was the same across all the service providers. Yeah, good question. So, so yes, we support AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud Platform today. Um, they all generally use the same framework for how we go about doing that. So if, if we ever decided to secure, uh, to support like, you know, Ali cloud or something like that, we, we certainly could. Um, there are definitely differences across the cloud providers. So that's one of the challenges that, that, that people have actually with multi-cloud kind of strategies is, you know, AWS does things one way, Azure does it a slightly different way. Uh, so as best we can, we have exactly the same functionality across them. Um, but you know, there, there are some minor differences, but it's, it's very much in the minutia. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm, of course. Okay. We did our deployment. And so now I just want to go ahead and verify that this all worked. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up a shell here. Um, this is actually logged into that BDDS and I'm going to do a dig and this is super boring and nerdy. So hopefully everybody like knows what dig is. Uh, but basically I'm going to do a manual DNS query against uh, a DNS server. And I've got it in my history here to make it easier. So I'm doing a dig at the BDDS that I just deployed. And I'm looking for this record that I used to demonstrate the, you know, set it up, take it down. And the query was successful. So I have basically successfully deployed um, the DNS data that Amazon was managing into a blue cat solution. And now I have all of this sort of wrapped up. I have a single source of truth and a single authority for all of this information that's gonna allow me to manage this a lot more effectively. Uh, before you move to the next uh, portion, a question about gateway. I understand that the gateway component is uh, used to connect to any public cloud service provider and pull information so that you po can populate the address manager, right? But why did you decide to, to, to have two different um, uh, separate components rather than integrating the gateway as a function in the, into the address manager? 
Uh, it's a really good question. We, we did it very deliberately. Um, so our, our address manager is sort of the crown jewels, right? It's the, it's the database of record for everything, all these configurations across the global enterprise. Um, what we don't want to do is enable any old user to be able to sort of hammer that thing with requests. Right, um, you know, people can do you know uh, badly formed queries against it, whatever, bring it to its knees. So we introduced Gateway as a integration point for anything either in our ecosystem or outside our ecosystem that we want to give people access to. So within that framework, we can now um, we can now dictate what roles people have. I mean, we can do that in BAM as well, but we can we can now give people access to specific functions like create a resource record, create an MX record, you know, something like that. Um, we can also then sort of um, integrate with a various, you know, a multitude of systems, like I mentioned ServiceNow and ACI, um, and we can do that in a safer way because it's all coming through this gateway server. Now you can deploy as many gateways as you want. You can put them behind load balancers. You can do you can do any number of things, but we specifically wanted to keep it separate to protect the the, the mission critical part of this, which is BAM. So it's mainly for segregation of role and responsibilities. That's the reason. Somewhat, and also to kind of scale out how people can access and, and whatever. But but yeah, it, a lot of it has to do with uh, roles and responsibilities and, and being able to sort of push that out to the end users. Thank you. The Is, is this pull only from these um, cloud providers or do you also push configuration? So can I manage it in BlueCat and actually push config back up into my cloud provider? Uh, yeah, you can. Uh, so, so you would do that. Um, you, you can, you can push DNS information to cloud providers um, from this. You could, you could set them up as a secondary and, and push information. So, you, you can do that. Um, it's actually better to do that through a, a workflow like this. You know, a, you know, something else that allows you to manage. And, and we provide one actually. If you go out to our again, if you go out to our GitHub account, um, you can find uh, some solutions that allow you to manage records in Route 53 or Azure Private DNS. Um, so, so yes, you, you absolutely can. Um, as far as the discovery goes, the discovery is, is certainly a pull. And then what we do for visibility is we create a, a, uh, an SQS, a simple queue service in, in Am I'll just talk Amazon specifically. Uh, we create an SQS and then a SNS subscription that, that basically monitors that queue. And then we check that queue, uh, to see what changes are happening. So it is a, it's a pull. We did most of our customers, uh, Justin, when we when we talk to them, the last thing they want is for anything to be pushing into their network. So we we tend to build all of our solutions as okay, you go authorize yourself to go out and grab this information and bring it down. So the address manager is it running in the cluster environment? Uh, how do you protect the data? Yeah, so you can have uh, you can you can have multiple BAMs, uh, Blue Cat address managers with replicated data. Um, so you can you, you can definitely you know uh, protect yourself from a you know a, a single point of failure there. Um, and, and Scott's Scott's exposed these services directly on the internet because he was <laughs> lazy for a demo. But but he, nor, normally those services would not be on the internet. Yeah, no, not at all. Yep, simply here for convenience, and it will be destroyed in about forty five minutes when we're done with our session. So. All right. I have a question. But maybe uh, uh, it's more basic than than you know what I have asked. But actually, if I want to adopt your solution, okay, what is the migration process? I mean, I have several uh, traditional DNSs and all these cloud DNSs as well. I mean, it takes some time to, you know, I know the discovery part is cool to see in a demo, but actually in the real world, you know, there is some planning behind it. <laughs> Yeah, um, so that's a great question. You, you could probably we could probably devote a couple of hours to discussing that. I actually used to run professional services for Blue Cat, and and that's what that that organization does is they help customers get through this migration. Um, I, I would I would give you a couple couple of points. It it can be quite simple if a customer has a well organized DNS environment and and they've done a good job of maintaining that and pruning old records and things like that. Um, unfortunately, that happens about 0.0% of the time uh, because people generally, as they grow up as an organization, they're using, you know, Microsoft Active Directory for DNS and, and they, they dump a bunch of data in there that maybe isn't organized like it should. And then they um, do an m and and they bring in somebody who's got just, you know, standard Linux bind servers running and now they've got data in, you know, namedy.conf files. And so, so there's a, there's a pretty 
I don't want to say laborious, but there's a, a pretty detailed process that we go through to bring all of those data sources together and, and clean up that data and then import into our system. We also have um, uh, sort of newly, and it's related to what Andrew is going to demo here in a minute. Um, we have a way to actually make that completely transparent to a customer because uh, some of the capabilities that we've built allow us to query multiple uh, potential authorities of this information. So what we can do is we can sort of insert ourselves in front of your existing system, proxy those queries as they come in. And then as we find unique new queries being made, we can recreate that record in our system and then at some point we just flip the switch and you're now using Blue Cat. So that's, uh, that's the new way of doing it that's way easier uh, for customers. Great question though, it's a big topic. All right, Andrew, take it away. So, yeah, so we want to highlight a different uh, component of our system, which uh, um, as we've mentioned a couple of times, we call Edge and, and Edge is um, has a very smart DNS resolver, and 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 as as Scott and I have been talking about, it allows for um, uh, discovery and interoperability between different namespaces, so different authorities out there. And we're trying to figure out like what is a good way to demonstrate this because it's it's you know we can go to the command line and do a bunch of digs or look stuff up, and and um, and you know we came back to the context of well you need this because you're deploying applications and applications require services across um, many different potential um, uh, clouds or different different authorities. And so uh, so I said, hey, let's write an application and, uh, you know, it'll only take me a couple hours. And meanwhile, you know, longer than that later, uh, we have an application. Um, so this application, let's just pretend for a second, it's a e-commerce application. I call this thing cool app. It's version 1.0. It's running in AWS US East 2. It has several dependencies. Um, it's connecting with api.ups.com because my e-commerce application needs to sort shipping. And so that zone is the internet. We expect it somewhere on the internet and it's for my shipping system. Um, it also needs to speak to my customer database. In this case, that customer database is in US East 2 of Amazon as well. And I can tell from the DNS record here, just sort of tracing through the C names, that this looks like a RDS as a service. So it's basically like a serverless, you know, um, relational database system that Amazon provides. And so I'm able to resolve that. Um, I've got my user over here, uh, who's me running Cool App. I'm remote, so I looked up the internet record for this. I got my A and my quad A, and I'm on Blue Cat's network, and here's our internet gateway IP address and uh, my location, Toronto. So I'm the one who's actually using this thing. Um, and we have uh, this record that's yellow. This is our product catalog. So we, you know, our company has a service with all of our products in it, and that's necessary to display on this e-commerce side. The reason it's yellow is um, we've gotten resolution for this record. Here's the A record, which is in the public IP space. But I was expecting a private address because in AWS US East 1, I actually have a private endpoint for this service. I don't want to go out to a public IP address. I'm going to pay for data in and out, potentially have security issues, uh, performance issues. I'm not expecting that, and that's why it's highlighting as yellow. Maybe my application's still working fine, but it's non-optimal. And this happens all the time because people don't see what's happening with DNS. And so you might be working, but you're 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 resolving to the wrong thing, and therefore you're not taking the least expensive route, both in terms of performance and cost. These are costly potential mistakes. And then I also need to get something from the data center. In this case, uh, my data center is on premises. It's 172.16, uh, and um, uh, I'm getting an X domain. I can't get there at all. Fantastic. So um, in in Blue Cat Edge, you know, we have the ability one to sort of see everything that's going on. So I just made all those queries, and you know, here's all those queries here. Here's my uh, customer DB query. Here's my UPS query um, that I did. Uh, you know, the look for that product catalog, it's all there. And as a um, administrator, I can certainly see 
that my product catalog resolved, but you know, it resolved to um, a public I, I, you know, IP address, whatever. I can also see latency information and everything else I need to see. Um, but here's also where I can go configure these namespaces. So um, I'm gonna go to my site and this is a often used demo system. So uh, I'm running this in AWS. I see, you know, the administrator has set this up, but there's only a namespace for AWS and a namespace for East2 where I'm resolving stuff and one for the internet. The system is set up with these building blocks of namespaces. I've got my site here, which is that region of AWS, and it just wasn't set up correctly for whatever reason. So I need to add a couple of namespaces. I'm going to add um, my internal namespace. And I'm going to add my AWS US East One namespace. I, I can choose an order; doesn't really matter the order. The system quickly is going to figure out, you know, what what goes where. Um, but I'm a sorting type person, so I'm going to order it here and click save. And now I've I've re-engineered the way DNS works for all of AWS um, in US East Two, where this application is running. Um, and so now, when I go back and look at my application, um, all of a sudden I'm getting everything green. So this resolved, great. It resolved to my data center. This thing that was resolving to the internet now is an alias to API catalog e-commerce.blaucat.local. So here's another DNS um, domain and here's its IP address in the network I expected. Fantastic. Um, Here's, uh, you know, the other records that are still resolving appropriately. Um, so great. I'm going to have the same issue. I've got a version of this application running on on Azure as well. And if I look at this in Azure, um, and so in this case, you can barely see, but I'm running this in Azure. There's its IP address. Um, I'm still here in Toronto. For some reason, my location is now unknown from an Azure standpoint. Um, but now this catalog still running in AWS, but I don't have network connectivity directly to AWS. So in this case, I expected the eternal, external IP address, the public IP address, that's the one I got. So that's a good thing. Um, I'm not hooked up to the data center. I was able to get to UPS and it could not resolve this customer .cool app at all. So it found zero host records. So it found the domain, coolapp.blaucat.be, but but with zero host records. So, you know, obviously I forgot to configure my um, Azure as well. And so I can go to that configuration and this is sort of a one-time thing. Um, and I can go add my Azure US East 2 and I can add my Azure internal and do my lovely sorting, fantastic. And now um, I can resolve and everything's green, so fantastic. Now, here's some of the cool stuff that I haven't been highlighting. One is these two records are in the same zone. In this case, one, resolved to local Azure. And now instead of this being a RDS as a service from Amazon, the same DNS record in Azure is a private link database. Um, and so I've got my customer db.privatelink.database.windows.net. And this whole idea of private links, both from an AWS and Azure side, causes so many headaches. Azure uh, does a wonderful job, but for whatever reason, they decided when you use a private link, they're gonna put it in a private link.database or a private link you know, uh, you name it, whatever type of resource you're using, there's a predestined zone for you that you can see in your organization, which makes it very difficult if you have multiple Azure VNets, they're all gonna have a private link.database.windows.net. So we're able to look across the same zone in multiple namespaces. Um, and in this case is internal and external, fine. But if I just go back to the AWS case for a second, um, in this case, it's uh, two different regions of Azure. So these DNSs are actually managed separately. They're different namespaces. 
They have different authorities. And doing that comes with a lot of risk if it's not done well, because you could potentially pull information from one namespace and have mix it up with the others and get the wrong SOA record and all sorts of nonsense can happen. And so what we've done is allowed for this sort of discovery of namespaces, finding out where the right answer is um, and, and doing it in a segmented way that keeps DNS healthy and working. Um, okay, so that's great. Now I'm able to resolve. And if I go look back in, in Edge um, and I look at my query logs, I should now see that, you know, exactly what just reflected. So, you know, I, I was getting, uh, let me just close this sucker. I was getting um, NX domains for some of these domains, like the internal domain um, here. So there was no answer to it at all. Um, and after I made the changes, uh, you know, now I see, I see answers. So fantastic. So, um, uh, you know, I, I can see that and understand the behavior of the application down to who the source IP is. So I know exactly who's querying this stuff, um, which is great. Um, you know, you also notice things like, you know, I, I mentioned latency before. When I was looking through this, I was looking and, and noticing that, you know, um, UPS, in this case, was one second of latency. Um, in this case, it was 29 milliseconds uh 17 milliseconds 29 milliseconds when i compare that to uh some of the other records i i saw like you know for anything local it was five seven and uh and ups if you actually look at that record has like a five second uh time to live on it so it's really never in cash there's always a penalty for going to it and that's my point if i had an application that was pounding on that ups record then i would never be able to cache the result and so therefore, I would always expect a delay there. And it's, it's something that that um, is important as part of application design. Hey, Andrew, uh, yeah. I've got a question. I got a question for you um, regarding it's uh, the latencies and things like that that you track. Do you have any like kind of alerting thresholds within the system that would say if your latencies get too high in a specific zone that you could be notified? Yeah, so we we um, we capture all of that. And we store it all and we give people specific, uh, uh, you know, percentiles. And then all of that system, all of that data can be, um, we can leverage their, you know, monitoring and alerting systems to let them know if things have changed. The, the uh, Scott and I do a lot of exploratory uh, analytics outside of our product team who are working on stuff, pounding out the products. Uh, Scott and I are like kids in a candy store with, with DNS data. And, uh, and what we try to find is the ones that matter, you know? So like if it's adfly.com or something, who cares? Like it's a domain you don't care, it's an internet tracker, you know, like you might as well just block it and give people a, sorry, adfly.com people and, and give people faster internet experience. If it's, if it's an internal domain, then it's super interesting because sometimes you'll see, um, okay, I'm getting high latency for this zone only from my clients in Asia. Well, great. I probably need to move a copy of that zone closer, you know? Or in some cases, I can't resolve it. That's the other super interesting case where like 93% of the clients can resolve that record appropriately. These 7%, 23% of the time they're getting serve fails. And we see that sort of stuff, you know? And we find things like lame zone delegations. And, and so it's it's um, that visibility that's fantastic. And then, yeah, we, we integrate that with alerting. So I guess my follow on to that as well would be uh, from a logging perspective, do you have any specific connectors into like uh, SIEM type workflows like a Splunk or something like that? Yeah, you got it. So we're we're connected to Splunk uh, and we're connected really it's it's whatever SIM our customers want and, and they can either just get the highlights or they can get all of the data and then also Edge runs in, in, in from a you know in the cloud and so for our customers that um don't want any of this data as secure as it is in the cloud they can actually just dump all of this into their own data lake if they want to as well so um we sort of run both ways there so um so the so great you know I, i've got a uh version of this application and it's running but i'm a um I am a DevOps guy or whatever, I'm an application builder. And so I wanna build a new version of this thing and deploy it. So, and I might do this every other week. So 
I'm going to go build uh, version two of this application and uh, and deploy it. Um, and you know, th there was an interesting vulnerability, or at least a um, you know proof of concept that came out a little while ago from some security researcher who realized that everybody, when they build software, including me right now, you'll see like I my system's going to download a ton of packages from the internet, from in this case the crates.io Rust repository and incorporate that into my software. And he found out that in cases where customers, you know, the companies that make some of these, um, you know, he could spoof external packages for them. I mean, it was a sort of really innovative, intriguing hack. And basically of the stuff that gets download, insert in, um, you know, malware. And so he was able to, to in a, from a, like a supply chain standpoint, insert malware in, as people built Ruby or Rust or whatever type of applications were out there. It was super interesting. And so I've just built version two of this thing. Um, and let me just make sure I built it correctly. Yeah. And so now when I, and I built it and deployed it in real time to Azure and AWS. And now when I look at this thing, I see some changes. One is in version two, beyond just getting to the order entry system, I went to this other system, which I've still labeled order entry, but let's say whatever, it's some other system. In this case, my policy in edge is, all right, we didn't know they were gonna go to this other system. We want to protect uh, DNS and make it, take some of the privilege out of DNS, but we're gonna alert somebody that this system that's running in the cloud that never looked up this host record internally is now looking it up. It's not an alarm bell, but we wanna let somebody know. So we're just gonna monitor that. Also, this thing started looking up this avsvmcloud.com, and and in that case, that's on our threat list, and we blocked it. And, and that whatever it was, the domain associated with um, with the uh, sunburst attack, but it could be anything on threat intelligence. The point is, my application has started to look something up that is on my threat list, and I want to make sure I stop that and alert people. And uh, and and you know, we don't want to sort of go down the security hole, but what, whether that's sort of like uh, DNS tunneling C2 or DGAs, I just pick something that's on almost everybody's threat list, added that lookup to the application, and you see that we we block it immediately. So um, so now I've got, you know, th this view of version two out there, and in uh, and, and version 2.0, is, um, is a slightly different configuration of DNS. We think, and uh, you know, um, and and like you know, customers. When you're running any sort of, it's interesting. And but when you look at infrastructure versus a a you know user driven client, a user driven client might look up, you know, three to five thousand DNS queries a day, and they're going to be over like a thousand different FQDNs uh, domains. And why, like things like Google Look Ahead. You know, like if I look at my traffic um, running off of my machine, like if I start typing uh, COVID because I'm looking for the latest um, vaccination information here in Toronto, Google's going to look up, you know, everything starting with COVID. And it'll look like I looked up 20 different domains that were or COVID related. I didn't go anywhere. It's just Google doing look ahead. So there, it's obvious right away when you see user-driven traffic versus machine-driven traffic or server-driven traffic or IoT-driven traffic. With IoT-driven tra uh, driven traffic, it's it's exactly as I was showing you before. You know, it's the same domains over and over and over again. And that allows you to close the uh, box, to shrink the box. Um, the, the example I always give is like for our retail customers. A point-of-sale machine looks up 18 different DNS records. If the 19th is something known to be good, like Google.com, it's compromised because a point of sale machine does not look up Google.com. And so if I can constrain what it's allowed to do because it's special purpose, now I can at least be monitored. This thing looked up something internally that we weren't expecting. And this thing looked up some, uh, some you know, a domain that's known to be compromised or to be part of a C2 uh, chain. So. So, you know, we, we've shrunk the box around this thing and created policies that now give me that information sort of in, in real time, um, which is which is good. Um, you know, DNS prevents the lookup. If, if it's on threat intelligence, like we know it's bad, then it's a super efficient way 
to stop. Like, you know, you know, you're not stressing your firewalls. You're not going through web proxies. You already know it's bad. Stop the DNS lookup. Yes, they can go direct IP. Yes, they can do other things. From a hygiene standpoint, everybody should have it. Better would be if you were looking for behavior and bad DNS behavior on top of it, the other things we do beyond just the threat intelligence, but that hygiene is, is critical. So we try to shrink it down. We know this is a special purpose server. It's running in Amazon. It's only allowed to do these things. We'll give it like a monitor leeway for other internal stuff, but we're going to lock down external pretty heavily um, because we want, um, we want to know about any aberration because it is predictable DNS. Um, Sorry, Andrew, maybe I've... Yeah. I might, I might have missed something in there, but that, so this policy management, how do the policy updates happen? Where, where are you grabbing that information from and how do I keep those policy lists updated? Yeah, so we, we um, you know, we, we work with partners like CrowdStrike to provide uh, threat intelligence that is updated in real time. Uh, our customers, depending on the size, you know, and whether or not they're syndicating their own threat intelligence, uh, we'll pump that in as well, and we have the appropriate APIs for that to keep pumping in, you know, updating your own. Um, and then we build additional domain knowledge as we see stuff. Like if we see active tunneling to a domain, now that sort of gets incorporated into customer specific threat protection. Um, so it's a combination of all. Um, and sort of depending on the customer, they might just go with what we have, or they might add their own um, on top of what we have, or they might add their own instead of what we have, but it, it's, it really depends on the customer. And the yeah. policies themselves are built in edge. I mean, we just, we go through and, and create a policy for, you know, um, you know, I've got my um, monitor approval for monitor unapproved domains. And this is, this is the, you know, uh, policy I created for this demonstration. So you can you can very much create your own policies. So you can block, redirect, you know, allow type policies. So um, it's all open, customizable. Yeah, and in our demo system, there's all sorts of stuff. Customers, I mean, our I guess our different essays have done throughout time, but uh, but yeah. So there's a bunch of different types of policies you can create. You create them based on time. You can create them based on domain lists, based on uh, DNS threat types. Um, you know, a variety of different ways to do it. Um, and uh, and again, like the key is, um, you know, there's the user stuff, and then there's the machine stuff. And uh, you, you know, companies should really be looking at those things differently because they're very different domains. Um, you know, li like users, users. You know, the number of of domains that are bad for some point in time because it's a you know it's Joe's bait and tackle shop who uses WordPress and they don't maintain their WordPress well and has a vulnerability and somebody basically leverages that vulnerability to utilize that website as part of their command and control. It's not Joe, nothing got downloaded. Somebody's searching for bait, they go to Joe's. That doesn't mean that they've downloaded malware. It might mean that some of the comments in Joe's blog have instructions for malware, you know? So, so um, but it's obvious really obvious if it's, if something's actually compromised because now you see periodic queries now you see check-in queries every five minutes or every two hours things that aren't somebody just you know surfing the net looking to buy some bait so that is cool app version 2.0 um but in all seriousness so that that i hope this like showing the dependencies on an application was uh was a good way to demonstrate, you know, the DNS dependencies. If this were a real application, I would expect probably more dependencies, depending on the type of application it is, certainly more. Um, you, you'd see other types of DNS queries. Like here, I'm, you know, for this, for this catalog that I'm getting internally, I'm just doing a, you know, a host record lookup, but I probably would be doing service discovery and looking up some SRV records and trying to figure out what the healthy node of, you know, there's, there's, you know, so it's not as sophisticated as it would be normally, but, um, but we're just trying to use it again to demonstrate the, um, the dependencies that always exist there in any sort of application. And the fact that the second I move something in the cloud, those dependencies, one, might be in other zones like the data center or different cloud and two the likelihood that i start having overlapping uh zones where i actually want to resolve against both of them 
becomes pretty high and customers struggle to figure out how to deal with that as opposed to just you know leveraging and allowing and uh as we as we uh enable we do have a really good question from bruno from twitter um is ipv6 fully supported and are there any implications for dual stack so yeah you see v6 queries throughout this um the uh the implications for dual stack i mean it, it it's it's you know from a name standpoint or a dns record type standpoint th there's no difference so by name I'm, I'm talking about the 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 dns name that's queried for instance um from a you know i want to actually manage and block when things resolve to certain ip addresses um you know that's where um uh you know a lot of the threat intel right now is is more v4 based than v6 based um and uh you know and where where you you, you may potentially run into some complexities but outside of that yeah this is um you're seeing v4 and v6 here from an enterprise standpoint like stuff running inside uh the perimeter of most of our customers there's um and maybe a bunch of you know this already uh maybe there's dual stack uh depending on the type of customer but by and large it's still an ipv4 world in the world of private uh ip space um some of our customers have very uh aggressive um uh you know initiatives along the way to at least be dual stack some of them are all the way at v6 especially like our uh, some of our service provider customers or some of our like high tech type customers um try to route v6 only but you know the the complexity of switching from v4 to v6 forget about dns forget about the network standpoint you've got tons of of applications and services that don't listen on v6 like it's 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 a huge undertaking for what and so where we do see a lot of v6 is on the cloud outside on the public ip space um and so again more and more dual stack internally but but uh i don't know scott probably 98 percent of our customers are still it's still v4 first and v6 an afterthought and on the inside of the company like um especially the companies already exist you know it's not greenfield um the the amount of effort for the benefit right now is is uh isn't there yeah, we are we are seeing some some of our U.S. federal customers are now under mandate to to start you know speeding up their uh, their process of adopting IPv6, but yeah. it, it's still you know just given the complexity way down the road for all almost all of them. Yeah, I have a question, and I'm not a networking person. So service meshes, does this support those? Like, what what would be the relationship if if an organization was using a service mesh? Would they use this too, or? Yeah, so like a lot of service messages today are going to come with some level of service discovery. Fantastic, and uh, and and that, as far as we're concerned, is you know the, the the DNS potential aspect of that is another namespace. And so, if nothing outside of that mesh, for instance, let's say you've got you know some Kubernetes clusters running, nothing outside of that need to actually query inside, then it can be a completely disconnected namespace, and and you're not necessarily dealing with us. In in many cases, though, it's not as simple as that. And so, yes, uh, we we um, look. We're, we're very careful in um, not trying to get in the way of change. We try to facilitate change. And so, you know, the 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 there are specific solutions around service meshes that include DNS components. We don't just like we don't expect our customers to not use Route 53 because if I'm doing an ALB in Amazon, then you know these things become quite integrated. I also don't expect them to give up the DNS that might be within their service mesh. Instead, we integrate, overlap, and provide visibility to what's going on there. Yeah, um, I was going to say I I would have one just general, and I didn't know if you guys uh, had any more. Um, Kind of on the preso, but one of the things I, I had was curious about is like, what do your average deployment models uh, look like? So, if I'm an existing enterprise, say I've got a little bit of cloud, not a lot of cloud, are you guys like physical appliance, virtual appliances? I, I clearly see that you you, you have uh, appliances you can run on the cloud um, and things like that. But what, what overall is your deployment model, and what would you say is the uh, 
your largest percentage of, of deployments that you have, how, how do those look either being physical, virtual, and on what platforms? Good question. So um, I've been at Blue Cat for seven years now. And when I joined Blue Cat, it was probably, um, and that was before this edge system, it was probably 70% physical and 30% virtual. And the physical servers were sort of the bread and butter servers and the virtual servers were, you know, like customer had, you know, um, some VMware capabilities or whatever in, in the, I don't know, the uh, branch, for instance. And so let's, let's do, let's do, let's do virtual around the periphery, but you know how IT goes. This is critical infrastructure. It's DNS. If there's a problem, we don't want to deal with the VMware people. We don't want to deal with anybody. We want to just go to the vendor. So physical appliance better. It's now seven years later, and that is switched. It's now 30% physical and 70% virtual uh, from like our, our traditional integrity, our, our, our you know, bread and butter core product. And, um, and we expect that to continue going that way. We have customers that are 100% virtual that have gotten beyond the, the chicken or egg concern like, wait, if everything's virtual, therefore we depend on our VMware clusters, but the VMware clusters aren't gonna go up, but there's no DNS. The, things aren't as chicken or egg as that sounds. There's easy solves for that stuff. So they'll go 100% virtual. Virtual, as far as I'm concerned, represents flexibility because you know the way the business used to work is um, there's an assumption 10 years ago, 20 years ago for sure, 10 years ago as well, that uh, things aren't gonna change that fast. So I'll buy 79 appliances from you and of these sizes and deploy them around the world and they'll be good for five or 10 years. And now it, it that kind of lot, like somebody would be mad to think that nothing's gonna change in five or 10 years, everything's gonna change. So virtual gives our customers a lot more flexibility in where they would deploy this. Yes, our virtual appliances are available in, in the cloud. From an edge standpoint, it's a little different. There is no uh, appliance model for that. Um, you can deploy it in uh, on top of our integrity appliances, or you can deploy it wherever you want to. Um, but you, what you can't do is buy a physical appliance that's just for Edge. Um, Edge is, is sort of uh, microservice based, and and what we're not doing today, because frankly um, the market wasn't quite ready for it, but they're there now, is allowing you to just, for instance, deploy it in your Kubernetes cluster with a Helm chart or something like that. We're orchestrating the containers for you because you know, three or four years ago, we speak to our customers and, and that was basically a requirement. They didn't want to interface with the fact that there were containers there. They didn't care, um, but, but you know, they didn't want to manage them on their own. And, and, and that's changing rapidly and, and we look forward to that change. Would you be able to describe your licensing model? Sure. So obviously there's a traditional model that is appliance based um, and like any sort of network appliance model, um, you pay more for more powerful, you know, fiber instead of copper, you know, raid, all that sort of stuff, right? And then based on QPS, um, from an edge standpoint, it's always been per uh, IP address in big band. It's not like you buy 15 IP addresses and then 17 and then holy crap, we've got 18, so we need to speak to Blue Cat. You buy them in big bands. And, and the reason we picked IP addresses, and we're constantly thinking of other ways to do it, by the way, is... It's really difficult from a DNS standpoint to price in a utility-based fashion that represents um, usage. You could do it based on queries or queries per second, but our customers aren't actually in that much control of that because you know, um, you know, Facebook changes their you know their their layout of their homepage or whatever the case. And, you know, they go from 15 queries every time you go to facebook.com to 75 queries. Like it's the number of queries for us was something out of control necessarily of customer where a number of things on the network, given all the other stuff we're doing seem to make sense, but we do it in big bands. Um, we since will sell our, we, we sell this all as a big platform that can be uh, bought from that perspective as well. But uh, Jim, Scott, and me are actually in the middle of also trying to revisit and try to figure out, like, ultimately, things work best if you've got a problem, I have a solution, I can sell it to you in a way that 100% makes sense to you from a fairness standpoint, 
and uh, and I have the ability to take a purchase order and just the world works lovely, you know, and, and anything in between that, like if it takes me the eight minutes I just took to explain our pricing is, um, you know, creates resistance to sale. And so, uh, so we're, we're trying to figure out how to innovate on the price side as well. Is your primary go to market uh, sales motion director channel? Depends on the region. Um, and depends on the region, depends on the partner. But I would say that uh, that we that we we really enjoy doing as much direct as possible. We have some fantastic partners. We love the leverage our partners give us, and we support our partners. Um, but uh, but you know, especially on the large enterprise side, there is you know it's funny. We were talking before this started about. Um, the wish to get back on airplanes. I mean, I'm normally out of the office well over 50% of the time with our customers, not necessarily talking about the next RFC with DNS, but talking about their broad initiatives and, and trying to understand how we can get ahead of where they're going, you know, and, uh, and we're, 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 we're desperate to get back to that so we can spend that time partnering with our customers. And so where channel gives us a lot of leverage and, and we do a lot of sell through channel, like we want that direct connection um, with our customers as well. Okay, do we have a community edition for home labs? No, uh, um, we we're thinking about that from a, I mean, I use it at home, uh, but we we're thinking about that too, just also to see what people could do with it, you know? Um, like the more they can play around with it, it's funny, inside of, of um, you know, inside of a large, managed change managed high level of governance and compliance enterprise you don't find a lot of people just downloading stuff and changing stuff willy-nilly you know and and uh yet that same person at home happy to so no we don't but uh but but it's something that we've been thinking about uh we certainly allow our customers to deploy and and, and give it a shot and do whatever they want to um you know as we but but we don't have a light version for home So going back to uh, the gateways, um, is it uh, recommended just to put a single provider on a gateway or can you just stack them up or does it uh, depend on the size of the network? Yeah, so it doesn't depend on the size of the network. Um, you know, uh, if you, you know, pro from a best practice standpoint, it probably makes the most sense to deploy one in the region that you're discovering. You don't need to. But you know you'll you'll um, but if you had one in AWS East and one in AWS West, for instance, and we we don't charge based on the number you deploy, um, then you've got the thing right there, and the likelihood of some network connection issue or whatever the case down. But yeah, uh, there's some prescribed, you know, our expectation of of how many things you'll be discovering on one of the gateway nodes, but it's actually. Um, it's, you know, like it might, if, if you have a hundred VPCs and, and, you know, each VPC has 20 subnets and, and, you know, and, and potentially a couple thousand devices. Okay. It might do one big discovery after that. It's just in listen mode. It's, um, and, and by the way, whatever you have up there with those numbers of hundreds and thousands are nothing compared to what's on premises in most cases where we're talking about, you know, potentially hundreds of thousands and millions. So, so it, it it's actually it, it it's it doesn't tax. We we purposefully created in an asynchronous way. It's near real time. You saw Scott demo earlier that you know he stopped a machine, it showed up. It's not going to be instantaneous, but you'll see those changes within a few seconds. Um, we're 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 queuing and we're reading off of a queue. So in the case the connection gets broken, we can go catch up when when it gets reconnected. It's it's meant to be lightweight. It's meant to be deployable by the cloud teams and um, and accepted by them as opposed to, you know, uh, being um, looking like some external thing that they don't want to jam into their cloud.